Hi everyone, this is Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive at BrightPath, and I'm here to welcome you to this presentation on navigating the ransomware challenge, lessons in continuity, crisis management, cybersecurity, and leadership. I first made this presentation at the 2022 Secure360 conference here in Minnesota in the month of May. In this presentation, we'll be talking through a number of topics related to the ransomware challenge. First, by way of introduction, as I said, I'm Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive at BrightPath. I am a postgraduate student in the Department of War Studies at King's College London, and I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at Auburn University. At both of these locations, my research is on how do we deal with large-scale incidents like the ones we're going to talk about today. And BrightPath, of course, our company. Uh, at BrightPath, we work with the world's leading brands to strategically navigate uncertainty and disruption. Our specialty areas are crisis management, business continuity, and crisis communications. Here's our agenda for this presentation. We're going to talk about the ransomware challenge. We'll talk a little bit about best practices, what the best companies are doing. Uh, we'll do a little case study about leveraging exercises um, using one of our healthcare clients as, a, as an example of, of how you can use exercises to help address some of the ransomware challenges. I'll provide some closing thoughts and then we'll do Q&A. So let's first start by talking about the ransomware challenge. Well, I think the challenge is going to be fairly obvious, but let's go through some core data here. Um, information security, of course, is a critical business issue that impacts brand and shareholder value. Uh, in 2021, um, the healthcare sector saw a 44% increase in incidents uh, with 50 million patient records breached so far in 2022. This is from the Protonus uh, breach barometer. And we can see here on the screen, Twitter, MGM Grand, Anthem, Healthcare, Magellan Health, Marriott, and Zoom, all examples of large data breaches that have occurred in the last few years. Cybersecurity Ventures estimates that ransomware costs will exceed $265 billion by 2031, so just nine years from now. Supply management in a recent article from Charlie Hart notes that supply chain attacks have risen by 42% in the first quarter of 2021 last year, and that affected up to 7 million people. ICS is, uh, the ICS Cybersecurity Year in Review of 2020, published in 2021 by Dragos, states that security threats against industrial control systems and operational technology systems more than tripled in 2020. Last June, FBI Director Christopher Wray testified before Congress, and he made a comparison between the ransomware threat and the attacks of September 11th. And what he drew here in, in this comparison is that there were a lot of parallels. There was a lot of importance on the issue and a lot of focus coming now from the FBI on disruption and prevention. Of course, if you go back in time 21 years ago to the attacks of September 11th, a lot of the FBI's mission shifted on that day towards preventing the next terrorist attack. And there was a lot of emphasis on how do we disrupt and prevent that next attack. And here the FBI director is really positioning ransomware in much the same way where the FBI is attempting to think of ways to disrupt and prevent those attacks. We also see that maximum pressure is now becoming a tactic that is being used to force organizations to pay the ransom. We're seeing things like the deliberate public leaking of data following a ransomware attack. We're seeing DDoS attacks on top of the original ransomware compromise. We're seeing direct communication and marketing from ransomware groups to key members of organizations' boards and their customers in an attempt to pressure them to pay the ransom. And then even the social engineering of vendors to delete offsite backups in order to reduce your available options to try and recover from the ransomware attack short of paying the ransom. And we even now have ransomware as a service. And, and this detail coming to us from our friends at CrowdStrike, um, ransomware as a service, or RAAS, is a new business model. It's a model between ransomware operators and affiliates, where affiliates are paying to launch ransomware attacks that are being developed by operators. This allows the non-sophisticated attacker to launch attacks quickly and affordably. And they're finding these through advertisements on the dark web. These advertisements, these offerings, even come with 
24 by 7 support with ticketing systems for support. They've bundled value-added offers. They come with user reviews and support forums and other features. And these prices can range from $40 a month to several thousand dollars monthly. And why be afraid of paying ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month for ransomware as a service when the average ransom demand is six million dollars? This data here coming from CrowdStrike's report in 2021. And we see this played out if you look at the ransomware attacks over the last few years. Colonial Pipeline uh, is believed to have paid a ransom of four point four million dollars. JBS Meat Processor. Uh, is alleged to have paid an $11 million ransom, and CNA Financial is alleged to have paid a $40 million ransom. So even renting ransomware as a service and paying a twenty dollars or $30,000 a month fee doesn't seem like too big of a hill to climb when these ransoms can be at stake. Now, we would argue a couple key points, and, and I want to emphasize the, these as our views as we go into what the best companies are doing here. The first is that many organizations, most organizations that we interact with, view the ransomware challenge as only an IT or an information security problem. It's not. But that viewpoint leads them to write ransomware plans and practice ransomware plans that are IT and information security centric. And instead, we believe these plans need to be much more holistic and that company's approach needs to be much more holistic. And, but there's also the tendency as humans that we have where we tend to want to focus and invest on prevention. I want to stop the thing from happening. And that's an admirable goal. But we also need to think about it when it does happen, if it does happen, what are our response and recovery capabilities? Uh, Juliet Kayyem, who was a faculty member of mine when I went through the Harvard National Preparedness Leadership Initiative uh, a decade ago, uh, has a new book out just, just recently. And... One of the things that she argues in the book is that we have invested a lot in prevention. We've tried to stop terrorist attacks, and that's an admirable and important goal, for example. But they're still going to happen. And we need to also just consider how do we respond and recover and invest appropriately in doing so for when these things happen. We believe here at Bright Path that ransomware is a resilience issue, and it requires a whole-of-organization effort. It cannot just be an information technology or an information security only focus. It has to be a whole of organization effort. So let's take a look at what the best companies are doing. First is that the best companies are establishing a crisis management framework that addresses all hazards, meaning that it doesn't matter how we wound up in the crisis. It's going to be managed in a consistent way every single time. And the executives should expect that the organization is presenting them with a crisis, with issues that are escalated to them that are worthy of their attention and that are being managed in the same consistent process each time. I mean, can you imagine as a CEO having a crisis function where on Monday you have a hurricane you're dealing with and it's managed by in one process by one team in one certain way? On Tuesday, you have a workplace violence situation and it's being handled in a, by a different team in a totally different way. On Wednesday, you have a production system problem with your core technology product and that's being handled a totally different way. And on Friday, you have a ransomware attack and that's being handled in a completely different way. In one week, you've got four major incidents or crises and they're all being handled differently. We want a consistent framework that addresses all hazards. Here's an example of what a data incident response framework or a crisis management framework might look like. If you look down uh, kind of the bottom center, you can see a typical information security incident uh, being detected and managed and then rising to one where the security incident response team takes over. This is a more sophisticated attack. This appears to be an actual incident, not just an event that's tripped an alarm. Uh, And now we've got a decision to activate our data incident response process being made by this core data incident group. Think about that as communications, product, information security, information technology, your crisis management and business continuity leaders. Um, Looking at that and saying, yes, indeed, this has tripped our triggers. This is indeed a data breach, a data incident, a ransomware incident, and we need to activate our full data incident response group. This framework has clear incident leadership tied as an incident leader 
who's managing that process. And then the general counsel who is really in charge of this data incident, putting all of those things under privilege so that you're able to protect the organization's response for as long as possible against litigation and other probes. And then lastly, your executive leadership team making certain strategic decisions, and then your board or your private equity owners at the top of that. And then your partners being integrated here, outside forensics capability, notification and service partners for data breach, uh, PR and crisis firms, insurers, and outside legal counsel. This is There's a lot of different ways to structure this. This is just illustrative of a way to do it, but again, a consistent way of managing a crisis or a data incident where it'll be done the same way each time. The best companies as they establish a crisis management framework and plan have defined in that plan and framework clear roles and responsibilities and clear decision-making rights. Who is doing what? Who has been delegated authority to do what? And there's a lot of other things you want to have in your plan as well. How does the process get activated? Who has the authority to do so? What are the roles and responsibilities at each of the levels of this crisis, each of those boxes that we saw in the framework? What's the cadence of meetings and communication? Not just meetings of this team, but how do things get escalated to that next level? How are you communicating internally what's going on at the same time you're preparing a reputation management campaign? There will probably be multiple work streams, just as we, you know, in the example here for a ransomware incident, you can have a lot of different work streams, but four common ones are, well, we got to manage the actual technical incident, the security incident. How do we get our systems back? We have crisis communications. I'm going to have to protect the organization's reputation. I'm going to have to communicate internally. I'm going to have to communicate externally to regulators, to stakeholders, to investors, to um, local community and others. There's recovery. Can I use my disaster recovery capability to get these systems back online? And then there's a whole swirl around compliance and regulatory requirements and having to deal with government agencies that may have oversight of my industry or the particular business that I'm in. And you may have others. These are just some illustrative examples. And then lastly, in your crisis management plan, you want execution-focused checklists. So by team or role, what am I doing? What are the things I need to make sure I remember to do in this incident? And you have to write these things down because in the moment you will not remember them. The best companies have integrated their third party partners into the plan. And we saw this on the framework boxes, but let's walk through these briefly. For a data incident or a ransomware incident, there could be many different partners, but here are some. Outside counsel. You probably have outside counsel with data incident expertise. You have outside forensics capability. You may have a firm on standby that you're going to bring in to help you really detect what's going on and investigate that and conduct that forensic analysis that you need. You probably have cyber insurance that needs to come into play. You may have a ransomware or data breach intelligence firm or negotiators who can help you negotiate that ransom and can give you insight into the type of ransomware and the ransom group that's involved. You may have an outside PR or crisis communications agency. And then you may have an outside breach notification provider and service provider that will handle notifying the individuals whose data has been encrypted and then provide them with services, a call center, the letters that are required by state and federal statute and others that may be at play. This is, you know, particularly if you're if you have payment card information, you have personally identifiable information, you have personal health information, these kind of service providers can really help take that work off of your team's shoulders as you work through the incident. Then there's the whole spectrum of business continuity and disaster recovery. And this is an important part of understanding a data breach or a ransomware attack because it may give you options, but it also informs you in terms of giving you an understanding of the impact you're really being faced with. Now, business continuity helps answer some questions. A business continuity program really helps answer some of these questions that will come into play if you're the victim of a ransomware attack. What are your most important business processes? What is the impact to your organization when those processes are disrupted? And then what are the critical technologies that those processes depend upon 
to do their work. And then on the other end of that, what are the dependencies behind those critical technologies? Those technology systems that a business team uses, behind them, there are probably databases and other services and storage and network and other infrastructure. And you start to see how that plays out in terms of the spectrum of dependencies that sit behind saying, well, I need um, Microsoft Word in order to do my work. An effective business impact analysis as a part of your business continuity program really answers these questions because you're asking and you're determining through a methodology, what are those critical business processes? When do I need them back up and running? What are their dependencies on technologies, on vendors, on physical locations? If you don't have this, this becomes a much more difficult puzzle to solve when you have uh, technology systems that have been compromised in a ransomware attack. Now we don't know what who uses them. We don't know what the dependencies are. We don't know how long those business processes can be disrupted because of this ransomware attack. It'll be much more difficult to understand the impact. On the technology end of this then, this informs our availability and disaster recovery strategy. So for those most critical technologies that are identified in your business continuity program, what is the availability strategy for those? How are those systems backed up? How are those backups tested? How quickly can you realistically recover those systems and have those disaster recovery plans been tested? This becomes important in a ransomware incident because we're trying to understand if these systems have been encrypted in this attack, can I get them back? Is that my best available option to restore them from your backups rather than pay the ransom? Is this your fastest option to be able to do that? And you won't be able to answer that if you don't have these things in place. And of course, we also want some of those backups to be immutable, meaning that they couldn't be disturbed in a ransomware attack. Now, this also uh, behooves me to bring up the question about disaster recovery in the cloud. If your IT team or your cloud engineering team or others tell you that everything is fine because you're in the cloud, that's not being honest with you. And they're not thinking about DR in the same way. You still have to have disaster recovery requirements and expectations put into place, even if you're hosting on AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or some other private cloud setup. You need to make sure that those systems are backed up, uh, that you have the ability to restore and recover into a different region, that your backups are in a different region. So for example, if your systems are all hosted in AWS East One, then you need to make sure that your backups are in a different AWS region and they were able to restore and start up in a different AWS region. Otherwise, you're just as at risk as if you had your primary and your backup within the same data hall and the same data center. It's not going to work the same way. So you need to set clear expectations for availability and disaster recovery in the cloud. And again, effective resilience governance helps you accomplish this by putting these conversations in front of your steering committee or whatever your body is that governs your business continuity and disaster recovery program. Next is that your, your best companies in this space have integrated crisis communications into that crisis management plan. And think about how complicated this can get. The first is that you have to identify your stakeholders. And if you start to dig into this, there's a lot of different audiences that will have different communication needs during an attack like this. Internally, and then we're, we're summarizing this in a line, but it's much more complicated than that. Internally, you have your board or your private equity owners, you have your leadership team, and you have the whole team of the organization that will need communication in an attack or an incident like this. Externally, it's even more complicated. You have, in some way, shape, or form, you have customers and clients that are paying you for your services or your products. You may potentially have clients and customers of your clients and customers whose data is in your systems and may be a risk. If you're publicly traded or even privately traded, you have investors and major shareholders or owners. You have your board. You have key third parties that are essentially business partners of yours. There's the local community and stakeholders where your organization is based. And then there's the public writ large who in some way 
relies upon your services and product. And there's multiple channels of communication here. There's internal channels, there's external channels, there's social media. There's a lot happening in the communication space. And these are good to think about in advance. From a crisis communication standpoint, there's a lot of different communications that can be created in advance of a ransomware incident. And I would encourage you to do this as early as you can in your planning process. There's holding statements. When the thing has happened, what is my statement I'm going to have ready to go as close as I can get it to ready to go in advance to tell our team internally and to tell the media and other outside partners in case it gets disclosed before I'm ready to disclose it. What's the holding statement that I use? There's your press release announcing what has happened. There's the specific communication you're going to go to your customers who are going to want to know everything about what's going on as best you can share. A lot of companies will use dedicated microsites, one for customers inside a customer portal like Salesforce. Um, microsite to, your, to the general public, a section off of your main website that houses information and updates. And then how do you do the same internally on your intranet or in something like Slack or Microsoft Teams? And who's going to speak on behalf of the company? For some of your organizations that are large and has a, you have a large consumer base uh, or a, even a large business base that is your customer, you may need to put someone on television. You may need to put somebody on Squawk Box, on CNBC, to address this issue. Is that your CEO? Is it the head of your product? Is it your general counsel? Who do you put out there? And these are things that are good to talk about in advance as a part of planning long before you even have an incident so that you've got some frame on how you're going to address these issues if they come up. And again, I would encourage you to develop the strategy and the processes and your messaging now from a reputation management standpoint. I can't tell you how many times a, an organization's communications team, as we've gone in to help them with this planning or any other kind of crisis planning, I can't tell you how many times they've told me well, we'll just create the messaging uh, when it happens because it's impossible to create messaging in advance. Every situation is different. And that is not true. It is true that you every situation is going to be different and you will have to adjust your templated communication to specifically address the situation that you're faced with. But you can predict the risks that you're most likely going to be confronted with, and you can create this communication in advance. You can customize it in the moment, and then you're able to push it out. I would encourage you with every ounce of my being to do that in advance because in the moment, you will never have enough time to get it right. Do it in advance. Next is that the best companies have had some strategic decision discussions in advance. They have thought through some major questions before they're confronted with an actual incident. In a ransomware situation, here are a few of those. One is, will we involve law enforcement voluntarily? Will you call in the FBI in a ransomware attack? And if you're going to do that, you should establish those rep relationships in advance. Because when you need a friend, it is too late to make one. Build those relationships now. Know who you're going to call. Know where they're, you know, uh, you're going to call the, the local field office. You're going to talk with XYZ. Um, you want to build those relationships in advance and have a good understanding of each other, what each other are going to do. Will you entertain paying a ransom? Now, a lot of you are probably listening to this saying, I will not pay a ransom. There's no way I'm going to pay a ransom. But you might. That might be your best path to recovery. So the thing that you need to think through is how will you pay the ransom? They're usually going to want to be paid in some kind of cryptocurrency. And I don't know if you've tried to set up a Bitcoin account with a few million dollars in it, but you can't exactly do that in an hour. So this is an opportunity to use your outside resources, your law firm, uh, perhaps an intelligence and negotiation firm to help you with this. But if you decide to pay a ransom, you have to remember you're collaborating and negotiating with criminals who are probably not in the United States. You want to understand, you want to have proof that the attackers have what they say they have, and you also need to work with the United States Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Asset Control because you're essentially paying a bribe. And doing that without coordinating these actions in advance can result in personal and corporate civil and criminal liability. 
So there's a lot at stake here and you need to think through in advance how you're going to handle that. And then of course, there's disclosure requirements in a data breach, including a ransomware attack um, because you've lost, you may have lost control of PII, PHI, payment card data. So make sure you understand those disclosure requirements and you have a pre-vetted communication strategy in place prior to an incident, just like we discussed. So those are a few things that some of the best companies in this space are doing. Let's make this a little more real and talk through kind of leveraging exercises to illustrate some of these points. Now, when we talk about crisis exercises, there's um, some different terminology used, but there's really three kinds of exercises. They go by some different terms, but the three exercises are a walkthrough, which is essentially training. You're taking your plan and we're talking through the plan. That's just a walkthrough, but it will, some people will think of this as an exercise. The second is a tabletop. The tabletop happens when someone like me stands in front of a group and they've got their plan in front of them and I kind of literally take them through a scenario from move one to move two to move three and at each step we pause and we say, what do you do with these inputs I've just given you? And you essentially use your plan to talk through the things that you would do in that particular moment. The third is a simulation. And a simulation is when you actually do the things that you're supposed to do. So for example, in a business continuity simulation, you might relocate your team from your primary site to your alternate site, stand up operations at that other site, and then verify that those operations are working. In a ransomware simulation, we're not simulating an actual ransomware attack, you know, technically, where we're taking down a production system, but I'm providing you with inputs and insights into a situation, and then I'm having you do the things that are in your plan. So, for example, if it's, you know, uh, customize and publish a holding statement, I'm going to have you do that and show that you can do it and that you can follow your process and execute what's in the plan and be able to do that within the artificial time constraints that we've given you. So it's a really good indication, short of doing a, having a real incident, on will your plan really do what you need it to do in the critical moment. So again, let's look at this uh, data incident response framework that we shared earlier. And as I look at this, and I'm thinking about conducting a simulation, well, I see things here that I can test. I see things here where I can apply pressure in an exercise. And here are some of those things, right? I can look at how that CERT team, that security incident response team, I can look at how they detect triage and escalate an incident. I could even do that technically with a partner in a purple team exercise, right? But I also can look at, well, how do they escalate and communicate to the data incident response team? How do they activate them? What does that initial assembly and initial briefing of the data incident response team look like? Do they follow their checklist? Do they send the notification? Do they follow the agenda that's defined for them in the plan? How do they communicate upwards to senior executives in the board? How will they deal with the public exposure or disclosure of the incident? I can make that happen in a simulated environment and see what they do about it. What's their interplay with their third-party notification provider or their third-party law firm? How does the outside counsel factor into incident leadership and what actions need to be taken? What do, what do they expect they're going to be doing? What does the organization want them to do? In one simulation we ran a few years ago with one of our clients, they brought in the outside counsel at our recommendation. We did not prepare the outside counsel any way other than we normally would. We wanted to see what would happen. Well, guess what? The outside counsel thought that they should be running the incident, so they stood up and tried to run it. Well, that's not what the company expected to have happen, but that's what the outside counsel firm was used to doing. Now they're dealing with a larger client. They did not expect to have that happen. So this is why we test and practice these things to find these issues. I also like to think about, well, what are some key lessons learned in previous exercises that I wanna revisit? Because they've told me these things are fixed. Let's try them again and see if they work. And what are the key decisions I want the executive team or the crisis team to be confronted with. So again, if I think back to earlier, well, will they involve the FBI? Will they pay a ransom? 
do they have their crisis communication strategy well thought through? Those are things I want to I want to test. I want to put pressure on. And then we structure the exercise to apply stress into those areas and see if their plan will truly work in the critical moment. So let's talk about an actual simulation we did in November of last year. We identified some stress points. We we constructed a really realistic exercises, a realistic exercise with inputs from multiple teams in the organization, including information security, and we worked with the engineering team that owned the particular product that we wanted to test. So there's a lot of stress points. Some of these we talked about, but I was particularly interested in four things. The handoffs, escalation, and communication between different teams involved in the incident. In this particular client's case, the Network Operations Center, the Security Incident Response Team, the Data Incident Response Group, the Executive Leadership Team. The product that we were testing, the, the technology platform we compromised in the exercise was the, um, their APIs. They had a, a, a gap in their recovery and availability strategies for APIs. Well-known issue in the organization and one that they had deprioritized for recovery. They, didn't, they decided not to make the investment that particular year, so we wanted to take advantage of that and, and break it. So that's we worked with that engineering team to understand a potential route of compromise so we had a technically feasible exercise scenario. And then they wrote out for us what this would look like if it happened. So we had a very good understanding of the impacts. We wanted to test if they would involve the FBI, and we wanted to test their crisis communication strategy. So... The exercise was kicked off through an escalation. It started with the Network Operations Center detecting a performance issue with their APIs. They ran their kind of normal internal process. Of course, this was everyone understood this was an exercise. This was a three-day exercise. So in the morning of day one, everyone understood we were in exercise play. The Network Operations Center starts seeing metrics. We gave them screenshots of what those metrics would look like. They assembled their first incident call. Then they realized that this was an information security problem. It was not just a performance issue. They quickly escalated it to the data incident response group, which then assembled. And then the incident leader has to lead these calls. As the exercise facilitator, everything that we did was behind the scenes. We provided inputs in a realistic way. We provided inputs through text and SMS, email, and Microsoft Teams, and phone calls, just as you would receive information in a real incident. And so now the incident leader has to take all of of these inputs and then be able to lead in that situation using their crisis checklist, using the agendas that were set out in their plan for these incident calls. Here's an example of, of the type of email we would send. Um, this is a media inquiry that uh, comes from, in this case, uh, we're role-playing uh, Brian Krebs. is Brian Krebs on, or Krebs on security, uh, information security journalist. And he's found out that there's a data breach, right? He's found PHI data from this client on an Amazon S3 bucket. And so he's sending this in to the media at email address that they have advertised on their company website And there's no warning that this is going to happen. We're sending this communication. It's marked as coming from an exercise in this case. And we're going to see, like, the media team says they're monitoring this. Are they? Are they going to to see it and respond? But then they have to bring this into that incident and get get the inputs and decisions that they're looking for. We also structure things so that, no matter what actions get taken, no matter what decisions are made during the course of the exercise, that those actions have consequences. Sometimes those consequences are positive, sometimes those consequences are negative, but pretty much every decision made results in something happening. So in this case, they chose to ignore that media inquiry from Brian Krebs. They weren't ready to go public, so of course, we simulate that he goes public anyway. So here's the story from November 16th, 2020. And again, this is, you know, within an exercise. It's not real, showing that this company's main SaaS product uh, has been compromised and that they refused to provide a comment. One of the other things we simulated in this particular exercise is we had the FBI. They had decided not to notify the FBI 
even though they had this massive data breach. So we had the FBI show up at their corporate offices, again, simulated. Uh, They put them in a room because they weren't sure what they were going to do. As they were talking through what was happening, they forgot they were there. And they got on with other things in the exercise. So we had the FBI send them a subpoena. We created that. We didn't expect that would happen. We created the subpoena uh, as an ad hoc inject. We then sent that via email to one of the attorney contacts that was in the exercise, uh, which, of course, got their attention, and they were going to have to respond to this. Um, uh, and then there was negative press coverage, of course. And this, there's a simulated New York Post article, um, again, showing uh, that the FBI paid a visit uh, to this organization. So, again, this is another way that actions have consequences. In the exercise, we integrated third-party providers. I had mentioned this before, but we had several of their third parties that would be involved in a data breach in a ransomware incident were present for this exercise and allowed us to test those interactions. And then we also integrated their C-suite. Um, the way their framework was set up, if you recall, there was the data incident response group kind of managing the data incident, the ransomware incident, moment by moment. And then they were escalating certain decisions to their executive suite. Um, In this particular case, what we were testing is we wanted to see what it looked like and when they actually, when the general counsel and the incident leader briefed the executives on the situation, and then we put some key decision points in front of them. Those decision points were the recovery strategy on how they're going to get their systems back, the decision whether or not to pay the ransomware payment, And then their kind of review and approval of the general reputation management strategy uh, presented by the head of communications and the chief marketing officer. Of course, a lot of the tactical decisions from a reputational standpoint were already made and executed because they had a strategy they had defined previously and executives had signed off on. So they were not sitting around waiting on the CEO's got to approve all this communication. They had had pre-approved the strategy in advance of an incident and they executed on that strategy. This was them bringing an update on what that would look like. And then lastly, after action reporting. So here, uh, detailed after action reporting was provided at the end of this exercise that captured observations, what kind of happened factually. Recommendations, how could we be better and improve our performance? And then the company would track action items, priority, owner, and due date to improve their, uh, improve their preparedness and response for the next incident. And they would leverage their governance processes to ensure that those items were completed. So that's a little bit of an insight uh, into how you can leverage exercises to really tell if your plan will work in the critical moment. So a few closing thoughts. First, ensure that you're addressing ransomware through an integrated crisis framework. Do not just do this in information technology or information security. You need a whole of organization resilience effort. Second, develop strategy, process, and messaging now for reputation management. Do not wait until the crisis. You can build this messaging in advance and customize it in the moment. I would encourage you to do this for all of of things, all of the areas where you think you have top, you've identified kind of your top risks and threats that could happen. Third, use exercises and hold regular effective exercises. If you're just doing walkthroughs and tabletops, I would encourage you to take the time to do simulations or bring in a firm like ours to help develop simulations that can really test your plan and make it more like reality and what it would be like if you had a real attack. And then lastly, use your board. You have an audit committee or a risk committee or some committee that has some oversight over these areas. You have experts and other CEOs on your board leverage them to really help you build and mature your capability for incidents like this. Now, this is a webinar, so I can't do Q&A here, um, but I will say you can get a copy of the presentation uh, slides at brightpath.com slash secure360. And you can contact me anytime at brian.strauser at brightpath.com. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Be sure to take advantage of our other free resources, webinars, and videos that are on our website. And I look forward, if there's anything that we can do to help you, please reach out and set up an initial consultation at brightpath.com slash contact. I look forward to, any, to hearing your questions and other feedback. Be well.